What's up, everybody? It's VR Gamer Dude here, and today on Lunchtime with My Gear VR, we are going to take a look at one of the coolest VR documentaries I have seen yet. So today, we're going to watch Zero Days VR. It's a really cool virtual reality adaption of the full-length documentary, Zero Days. This is going to chronicle the Stuxnet worm, man, chilling stuff. So... All right, let's get in there and let's take a look at Zero Days VR. Okay, guys, so we're just about to get started, but I am going to do this as a no comment video. Um, I watched this earlier and, man, it was kind of uh, interesting. And, and I want you guys to be able to experience it without me babbling over the top of it. So let's go. Nuclear scientists were targeted by a hit squad. That's a bomb attack in the capital of Tehran. In a string of attacks. Iran immediately accused the U.S. and Israel of trying to damage its nuclear program. I want to categorically deny any United States involvement. Any Iran's infrastructure is being targeted by a new and dangerously powerful cyber worm. The so-called Stuxnet worm is specifically designed, it seems, to infiltrate and sabotage real-world power plants and factories and refineries. No one knows who's behind the worm and the exact nature of its mission. But there are fears Iran will hold Israel or America responsible. It's not impossible that some group of hackers did it, but the security experts that are studying this really think this required the resources of a nation-state. Natas is just in the middle of the desert. When they were building it in secrecy, they were calling it a desert irrigation facility. There is a lot of artillery and air force. It's better protected against attack from air than any other nuclear installation I have seen. So this is deeply underground. A centrifuge. You feed uranium mean and you have a cascade, thousands of centrifuges, and from the other end you get enriched uranium out. It separates uranium based on spin, the rotors. It spins so fast, 300 meters per second, the same as the velocity of sound. These are tremendous forces, and as a result, the rotor, it twists, looks like a banana at one point of time. So it has to be in balance because of any small vibration, it will blow up. So a centrifuge, it's driven by an electrical motor. And the speed of this electrical motor is controlled by another PLC, by another programmable logic controller. Centrifuges spin at incredible speeds, at about a thousand hertz. They have a safe operating speed, 63,000 revolutions per minute. Stuxnet caused the uranium enrichment centrifuges to spin up to 1400 hertz. Up to 80,000 revolutions per minute. What would happen was those centrifuges would go through what's called a resonance frequency. It would go through a frequency at which the metal would basically vibrate uncontrollably and essentially shatter. And then the second attack they attempted was they actually tried to lower it to two hertz. They were slowed down to almost standstill. And at two hertz, sort of an opposite effect occurs. You can imagine a kid's top, a toy top that you spin, and as the top begins to slow down, it begins to wobble at the very end. That's what it would happen to these centrifuges. They would begin to wobble and essentially shatter and fall apart. Here 
is a piece of software that should only exist in the cyber realm and it is able to affect physical equipment in a plant or factory and cause physical damage. Real world physical destruction. At that time, things became very scary to us. Here you had malware potentially killing people. It wasn't lost on us that there were probably only a few countries in the world uh, that would want and have the motivation to uh, sabotage Iranian's nuclear enrichment facility. So at Symantec, we have probes. We've actually seen world. infections of Stuxnet all over the world. It spread to any Windows machine in the entire world. In France, Germany, we had these Europe. organizations inside the United States in charge of industrial control facilities saying we're infected. What's going to happen? Could have very dire consequences. There was a deadline coming up where this threat would trigger and suddenly would like turn off the secretary, all you know, the White House, and the other starts shutting things down, or wake up some tech and figure out what's going on. We're going to create something new, something evolved that's going to be far, far, far more aggressive. That wasn't just an evolution. It was really a revolution in the threat landscape. We realized that we needed to do what we call deep analysis. Pick apart the threat, every single byte, every single zero and one, and understand everything that was inside of it. When looking at the Stuxnet code, it's 20 times the size of the average piece of code, but contains almost no bugs inside of it. And that's extremely rare. Which is code always has bugs inside of it. This wasn't the case with Stuxnet. It's dense and every piece of code does something and does something right in order to conduct its attack. One of the things that surprised us was that Stuxnet utilized what's called a zero-day exploit. A zero-day exploit is an exploit that nobody knows about except the attacker. So there's no protection against it, there's been no patch released. There's been zero days protection, you know, uh, against it. That's what attackers value because they know 100% if they have this zero-day type of exploit, they can get in wherever they want. We became more worried because immediately we discovered more zero days. And again, these zero days are extremely rare. The next very big surprise came when we infected our lab system. We figured out that the malware was probing the controllers. It was quite picky on its target. It didn't uh, try to manipulate any given controller in a network that it would see. It went through several checks, and when those checks failed, it would not implement the attack. It was obviously probing for a specific target. It was doing something with Siemens. Siemens software, possibly Siemens hardware. Stuxnet was targeting a very specific hardware device, something called a PLC, or a programmable logic controller. The PLC is kind of a very small computer attached to physical equipment, like pumps, like valves, like motors. What it was doing was replacing the code that's normally on that programmable logic controller with its own code. Those programmable logic controllers control things like power plants, power grids. This is used in factories, it's used in critical infrastructure, so the payload of Stuxnet was designed to attack some very important part of our world. Moving forward in my analysis of the code, it was absolutely clear that this piece of code was attacking an array with six different groups of, let's just say, thingies, physical objects, and in those six groups there were 164 elements. We, we then were uh, able to establish a very good match between um, the, the attack code and the configuration of the Natanz fuel enrichment plant. There were these six groups of centrifuges, and each group had 164 entries. And guess what? That was a perfect match to what we saw in the attack code. They built in all the code and all the logic into the threat to be able to operate all by itself. It had the ability to spread by itself. It had the ability to figure out, do I have the right PLCs? Have I arrived in the camps? Am I at the target? And when it's on target, it executes autonomously. 
That also means you, you cannot call off the attack. Was the U.S. involved in any way in the development of the Stuxnet? There were some cyber attacks on the Iranian nuclear program that you ordered the Stuxnet virus. Well, first of all, I'm not going to comment on the, the details. I, I can't of talk about uh, Stuxnet. I, I can't even talk about the operation of uh, Iran centrifuges. Right. Right. about the Stuxnet computer so virus. You can ask, but I won't comment. Zero but, sir, I'm not asking you if you think another country was involved in that. And West, this is not we have mechanisms in place at this point. where if we can root out folks who have leaked, uh, they will suffer consequences. It's a covert operation. Maybe you don't know as much as you think you know. Look, this is not a Snowden kind of thing. Okay, I think what he did was wrong. He went too far, he gave away too much. Unlike Snowden, who was a contractor, I was in NSA. I believe in the agency, so what I'm willing to give you will be limited, but we're talking because everyone's getting this story wrong and we have to get it right. We have to understand these new levels. The stakes are too high. We did Stuxnet. It's a fact. You know, we came so fucking close to disaster, and we're still on the edge. It was a huge, multinational, interagency operation. In the US, it was CIA, NSA, and the military, Cyber Command. From Britain, we used Iran Intel out of GCHQ, but the main partner? was Israel. Okay, over there, Mossad ran the show, and the technical work was done by Unit 8200. Israel is really the key to the story. The Natanz attack, and this is out there already, is called Olympic Games, or OG. We tried out different attack vectors. We ended up focusing on ways to destroy the rotor tubes. In the tests we ran, we blew them apart. And the first time we introduced the code into Natanz, we used human assets. Maybe CIA, more likely Mossad. Our team was kept in the dark about the tradecraft. What we had to focus on was to write the code so that once inside, the worm acted on its own. But the cyber delivery systems were tricky. If they weren't aggressive enough, they wouldn't get in. If they were too aggressive, they could spread and be discovered. But what NSA did was always low key and subtle. The problem was that Unit 8200, the Israelis, kept pushing us to be more aggressive. Now, instead of hiding, the code started shutting down computers, so naturally people noticed. And it spread all over the world. All right, there you have it. That was Zero Days VR. And man, let me tell you, that was absolutely amazing. So if you want to see this for yourself and you have a Gear VR and Oculus Rift, I'm going to throw the links for that down in the description. And as always, thank you so much for watching to the end of my video today. You guys know that means the world to me. And if this was your first time coming by the channel, man, I can't thank you enough for coming by to check out what I do here on Lunchtime with my Gear VR. If you want to see more great VR content, head over to my main page, take a look through my videos. You never know what you're going to find. Got a lot of Oculus Rift, Gear VR stuff in there. And after you do that, if you liked what you saw, smash subscribe down there. Come along with me the next time I travel through the internet and VR or whatever else the heck I'm going to do. But for me, guys, that's it. I got a meatball sub calling my name. This is VR Gamer Dude, signing off today, y'all. Peace.